Have you ever had uh, a friend that has been uh, with you, close to you, by your side uh, for decades? Well, I have been blessed to have a friend who fits into that category. And I met him years ago, years and years ago. We were both working in a restaurant called Mountain Jack's. And I, at the time, was a bus boy, uh, even, even though I tried to rename that to a bus man because of obviously, you know, the obvious reasons. But I remember one night I came back into the kitchen and I put all of my dishes on the, the counter where the dishwashers are. And I heard this voice that said, thank you. And I, I could not figure out where the voice was coming from. So I kept looking up and looking up and looking up. And then as I looked up, uh, the, the dishwasher area had uh, a place up above where you put the, the racks that you put the dishes on. And I saw the racks open and then this voice from literally like eight feet high said thank you as it came down to me. And that's when I first met my friend Tom Rendell. And he literally is not eight feet tall, but he is, uh, he is a very tall gentleman. But even more than that, it's just been a blessing to know him for many years. And today on the podcast, I actually have the joy and honor to interview him and to talk to him. So I want to welcome you, Dr. Tom Rendell, to the Speak With People podcast. Hello there. How you doing? It's good to see you, man. <laughs> Dude, I totally forgot about the parting of the, the glass racks <laughs> and me looking down upon you saying hello. <laughs> I'm like six and a half feet tall, so <laughs> it was it was so great, and I am like five foot four, so like literally, I like had to have a little step stool to put dishes up on the rack, and you're having to lean so far down. It was uh, it was something else. That was, That's where we met, my, though. Uh, That's where. Do you remember the um, sh the little Chevette that I drove that I got to pick you up and take you to work with me, and I got in the car and. Like the little Chevette is like a really little car and I'm not a really little man. So <laughs> <laughs> you could literally move the rear view mirror with your knee. Your, your <laughs> knee was up so high that you could literally move the rear view mirror. It was awesome. It was just yeah. awesome. Oh, that it was, was a, a great car. car. It was a great car. Well, welcome, man. It's really nice to have you. It's really good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And I'm looking forward to what we're going to we're going to talk about. Well, cool. I'm glad to be here. This is this is awesome to see you again because you moved 2000 miles away from me. I did. It's more like 1300 miles, but okay. but it probably yeah. feels like 2000. It feels like that because we've known each other since 1994. So we're going on three decades here pretty soon in a couple of years. Wow. That's pretty intense. That's pretty intense. Yeah. And we have re we have remained friends uh, th through the thick of it, like the ups and the downs. Holy cow! Yeah, there has been uh, there has been a lot to our friendship over the years. Thirty years of it. <laughs> <laughs> you can really, yeah, you can really experience uh, a, a lot of stuff together, and uh, boy, that really does build. Uh, but the problem was, like when I met you. You, you're only a couple years younger than me, right? Like a year and a half or so? Um, yeah, probably. I'm like, I'm just turning yeah. 44 this year. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be 47. So I'm, I'm a few, I'm your, I'm your elder by a few years, but like you, like you would just continue passing me up and everything. Like it was so funny because then I got the job as the youth pastor and then you came to the, the church, but you, you already attended that church or your parents attended that church. So that was the awesome part. And then like we were playing the guitar and then you got better at guitar. And then, you know, we were like everything that we've done, like then we were cooking and then you got better at cooking. I'm like, I'm like, I'm literally not going to teach this guy how to do anything, anything else, <laughs> because you just get better at all of it. <laughs> I may still be good at a joke though. I might, I still you're, might have you're a better on storyteller than me. And you can finger pick like James Taylor. And I never figured that out. That is true. That is true. I can, uh, I can get the guitar out and uh, and give it a give it a finger picking roll roll. Like it's a it's a really good time. 
Well, we're going to jump in and today talk about this idea of the soul of a communicator. Whew, the soul of a communicator. Like this is a this is a big deal because I think a lot of times people uh, have this idea or this misconception that as a communicator, uh, whether they communicate like this, just interpersonally, one on one, or on a team, or from a stage, or from behind a screen, uh, it's just words. Like communication part is just words. Yeah, there's body language and there's how I say them, but I think for the most part, a lot of people don't think through the soul part of a communicator. And so much of what Speak With People is about is trying to help people be a healthy communicator. And so that's why I'm glad to have you on here as we talk about the the soul of a communicator. Yeah, like the idea, there's that magic that happens when you connect with the communicator. I'm sure we've all had like that really bad boss. It's like they have the authority and they communicate just fine, but like you can't stand working under them. Uh, and I've sat under some people communicating and they're like, okay, they're, they're saying the right things, but for some reason it's not landing, it's not connecting. And it's, and then you get to know them in their personal life and they're just totally different than who they were when they were saying the things that, you know, they're supposed to say. And you're like, oh, okay, there's a disconnect between the person and the message of what they're saying. And that disconnect comes from a lack of like an inner life and self-awareness and health emotionally in on the uh, interior parts of us wow yeah so so just dive in like why is it so important then to have a have have the inside healthy uh i learned i guess the hard way like we all tend to learn that you can <laughs> only give away something that you have uh like if mm -hmm. i open up my wallet and i'm like i want to give jason a million dollars i have all the intention of giving jason a million dollars i open up my wallet and i look in there and i'm like well I don't have a million dollars. Sorry about that. And so often when we get up to communicate, we're like, I want to hand these people, you know, the greatest thing in the whole world. And we've craft, we've spent four hours crafting this message, eight hours or however many hours crafting this thing that we want to say. And, um, you know, we can say it all the words just right. But, you know, if we, if we don't have that experiential, understanding that tangible understanding of of what we're talking about uh it just it lands differently it doesn't hit because you can only give away something that you actually have and possess and that's what we're trying to do when we communicate is we're trying to give something away whether it's an idea or inspiration or vision uh something along those lines but like if you don't possess the thing you're trying to hand away then mm. then you're just kind of playing a role as communicator and it's not coming from like the authentic places and like all of the younger people coming up in these newer generations, they just have these BS sensors that go off like so fast. And if you're not communicating from an authentic place, they're just going to be like, I like, they just sniff it out like, like bomb dogs or something. I don't know how it is, but it doesn't land because they are like, you're not smoking what he's selling. He's not, he doesn't have what he's trying to give away or she. So it's, that's really important uh, concept there. Absolutely. And I think, I think you you just nailed it. I think the younger generations below us, they're just aching for transparency. They're just aching for realness. And I think, you know, so many people get away with not being real and faking it so often. And, and you're right. They're just, they're just sniffing it out like crazy now because they can kind of sense it. So, so walk us through like, you know, how, if we're someone and we're a communicator and we want to uh, do kind of a check of our soul, how can we do that? How can we go, okay, I'm going to have kind of a healthy soul check. Wh where do I need to start? You can, um, you can look to your emotional reaction to something and that tells you where you are on the inner life uh, like one of the gauges on the dashboard is your emotional reaction to something. And if the emotional reaction to something does not meet like the, the actual reality of the event, then we are emotionally unhealthy and bringing a bunch of traumatic baggage to the event. And then we add it on to the reaction and then it just seems like overblown. Uh, and that can wow. be 
that can be like an indicator that there's uh, undealt with stress, unprocessed emotions, um, or just physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion. There's a lot of different ways, but that's one of the, one of the things that you really want to look for is an emotional reaction to something. Emotions are real. We're going to have them, but if they don't match the reality of the situation and everything's overblown, that we're bringing something to the table that, you know, isn't e even in this conversation at all. Uh, so that's, that's one of the, you know, indicators on, on the, on the light. Other one is if you're just, um, constantly exhausted from like trying to be in a limelight, trying to be, mm. trying to do an impersonation of who you think you ought to be can be really mm. exhausting. And you're up there communicating and you're putting off an ethos of, you know, I wish I was this person. I'll just impersonate that person until uh, that gets really exhausting really fast um, because it's not coming from an authentic place of who you are. There's like this insecurity of, well, I don't really deserve to be here saying these things, leading these people. Um, so I better pretend as though I do have the authority to be here. And if you don't have a deep understanding of, you know, who you are, the value of who you are and what gifts and callings you have to do, uh, then you tend to just impersonate the person you think you ought to be instead of just be the person that you are and, and communicate from there. Those are two that just wow. kind of come off the top of my head. Wow. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about that, especially that second. Well, both of them are, but I'll, I'll just start with the second. You know, we have a whole generation, you know, our kids, you know, are really the first generation who's grown up with their whole lives online. And so they've grown up with parents who, you know, our parents, the only way that they could tell their neighbors or their friends about what their kids were doing was to actually pull out a photo and, you know, share them, share that photo with the person, whether they're at Kmart or, you know, wherever they, they were at. Well, our kids generation is the first generation where their entire life has been posted online. And so I think now we have kids who are struggling with being, you know, and trying to figure out who they are because of just what you said, like they're trying to figure out, okay, who's my online person? And the, does that match up with who I am regularly? It, it's just mind boggling to think about as, right. as our kids, you know, nowadays have to navigate uh, everything that's thrown at them, you know, online. Like we, we didn't have to deal with any of that. Yeah. Like those avatars you have to create on what you have to create them for multiple platforms, you know, whether your video game avatar or just your Instagram avatar, I think that is like this uh, continuation of, like who we wish we were, we're doing these impersonations. And now in the virtual world, we can actually like add a filter to us or, you know, like do a digital version yeah. of us. And now it, it can take a problem that is in society, which is, you know, not really understanding the inner workings of who we actually are. And then, you know, we create these avatars out there and it's the same kind of thing is when a speaker's up there trying to be you know, the all knowing sage or trying to be the all wise, whatever, um, that that's an avatar, just like, you know, you know, you create a Minecraft avatar or something and you're like, Oh, this is who I wish that I was in real life, but I'm not, I don't have the courage or I don't have the security or understanding or whatever. So I'll just, you know, craft something and then throw it out there. And I, I think the two are kind of the same thing, but one is, a little bit amped on steroids because this virtual world is brand new. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so go back to the first one. So, okay. Looking at the health of a communicator, you know, some of those, um, you know, buttons that are going off on the dashboard. What about the leader who doesn't pay attention to those buttons? Uh, you know, how, how, how do you, you know, how do they get to a place where they're going to listen to, you know, what their soul is saying to them or, they're going to listen to the people in their life because for sure if you know they're reacting negatively or out of anger or you know enough uh people are going to notice mm -hmm. and you know how, but but sometimes that leader doesn't doesn't want to listen to it so what has to happen in that leader's life where they get to that that breaking point where okay finally now i'm going to listen and pay attention to what's happening mm. 
Um, I, I think it comes from the realization that you're not a peddler of ideas. You know, you're not some kind of a vending machine that just pops out services of here's an idea, here's inspiration, here's a vision. You're a human and a human uh, that is you have responsibility of a group of people, whether that's going to be, you know, a church community or a, a classroom community or a family even like you're a human. And that means that you bring a lot more to the table than just what you're you know, popping out as services or goods or whatever. So we like tend to commodify ourselves into this object. Um, and then we elevate that up high and say, you know, I am a better vending machine than the person down the road. When really the, the idea that we're like these, you know, human vending machines popping out ideas and concepts and whatever that it's not essential to who you are. Like we have to tend to our own inner life uh, or, or we're not going to be a whole human being because like another concept is you're going, you don't replicate what you know in other people. Like how many times have you told your kids something and then, you know, they're, they're doing something else or is, like that common phrase, like, you know, don't, don't do what I do, do what I say. But the, the understanding <laughs> here is like, you replicate who you are. You don't replicate what you know in another person. Uh, they're going to take that and, you know, build it on their identity. But we're not just, we're not just taking information out of our brain and then putting it in the brain of another person. Um, like we're human to human and we, we like, we're life on life. And if you don't have what you're trying to give away, then what you're replicating in the other person is just going to be uh, the burned out, exhausted, um, objectifying, commodifying version of yourself. And that's what we see with, you know, when people look to a leader and they're like, I like this leader, I want to replicate the leader. They're not just spouting off what the leader says, but they're actually spouting it off how the leader is saying it and the spirit of which it's communicated. And um, they're, so they're replicating not just what they know or what they're saying, but they're replicating who they are. And that's really important because communication is more than just the replication of ideas. It's a transferring of life on life between human and human. And that, that's, that, can, be, that can turn abusive really fast when you forget about the human element of it. Wow. Yeah. She's almighty. Absolutely. So what are some, <clears throat> what are some practices that would be helpful to employ in our lives to make sure that, you know, our soul is, is healthy on a day-to-day -day basis? I think having enough margin in your life to be a healthy and whole human person is really essential. Um, you know, the practice of meditation used to be like this thing that nobody talked about. That's just what weirdos do. And now, like, if you look at culture, even executive leadership culture is like, if you don't meditate, now you're the weirdo because they're starting mm -hmm. to realize, okay, there's some value to like having this silent margin uh, and reflective place. Um, so I think being able to not just be like drowned in the emotion of the event, what meditation does is it kind of lifts you out of the emotion to give you like a metacognitive look at things. Like you're not just, you know, drowning in my own point of view or my own perspective, but you have perspective on your perspective. You have self-reflection, self-realization, self-understanding. Um, meditation provides the necessary silence needed for that reflective space where you're just like, oh, I didn't, now I can see how I see. Now I can understand how I understand. And it gets you out of your own brain enough and your own perspective enough to see that my perspective is just a perspective within a grander perspective. It's not the only perspective that's out there. And having margin enough to get outside of your own brain, to get outside of your own emotions and see something bigger, I think is really that's really important for a leader and for a communicator because then it gives you that ability to exercise like empathy and compassion um, because you're, you're understanding that like my experience 
is not the only experience that's out there. My understanding is not the only understanding that's out there. And I heard a definition of love today that like my brain kind of blew up a little bit, but love is realizing that someone else is just as real as you, hmm. their perspective, their emotion, their understanding, they're like, they're, that's just as real as mine. And so often when we don't love another, it's because I'm holding my perspective over theirs or my understanding over theirs or my emotions over theirs as more important or more real. And love is entering into this space where we understand that their perspective and their understandings and everything is just as real to them as mine is to me. And now I can encounter them on their terms and understand it as they wish to be understood. And then I can communicate from a different place and from a healthier place instead of just that top down, I'm the authority. So you listen to what I say and dispenser of ideas kind of a thing. Which, wow, that, that is so good. But that, that kind of leads me right to that place where I think uh, really healthy communicators, they care more for their audience, whether it is just the person I'm talking to across from coffee whether it's my team, whether it's the audience, if I'm speaking on a stage uh, who, or whoever's watching from behind a screen, you know, I think when someone is healthy and their soul is healthy as a communicator, they care more for what their audience uh, needs or wants or desires or how to help them get further. And I think that really is the, that's a big difference between like an unhealthy communicator whose soul is maybe not healthy and whose soul is healthy. Because you get to this place where you click, where you, you realize, hey, it really isn't all about me anymore. And so how can I care more for the person that I'm communicating with and how can I help them? Uh, and that really speaks into discipleship, right? Like when we walk alongside of somebody and help help them, you know, get to the place where they need to be. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, really powerful things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, it, and that comes with like, the word compassion is actually two words that means co-passion, you know, to enter into someone else's um, suffering and see it from their perspective and then to kind of feel what they're feeling. And, you know, sometimes there's an offering of, of help or advice or whatever, like a, a therapist can do. And sometimes it's just validating where they are, you know, and a good communicator um, when they're not, coming from I'm a place above everybody else trying to, you know, dispense these grand ideas that I have, but enters into the people's passion group, you know, whoever it is that you're talking with, and you're able to see the struggles, the doubts, the questions and the sufferings that the people have, and then validate it, but also speak some life and truth into it. You, that's more powerful than just you know, throwing out, you know, three points in a, you know, an illustration, like to really understand who it is that you're communicating to, and you're not communicating to them now, now you're communicating with them. And right. there's like this exchange, there's like an energy out there that a communicator is then directing towards like a shared uh, place. And a, a good communicator, you can talk for, you know, 45 minutes and people are so wrapped up and where you're taking them because they don't feel like you're just dispensing information. You feel like he's, this person is taking us on a journey and uh, a journey of discovery. And sometimes that sometimes it's not as, you know, it involves not being so precisely clear about everything you want to say and how you want to say it, but giving room for that, um, for who you're communicating with and that energy that is created there to kind of, lead and direct and you wrestle as a communicator with the ideas in front of them and with them. And that's a vulnerable, scary place to be mm. when you don't have it all worked out in your head, but you all go somewhere together. Um, and people, even though they may not have said a single thing during the whole communication thing, they felt like they were a part of it. Yeah. That's the crazy part. That kind of brings me to the, you know, I mean, especially for pastors, right? Pastors who stand up in front and they preach and, you know, there's this, um, there is this pressure on them to be deep. And I think that pressure, you know, to be deep uh, has led to many sermons or many 
messages that they're doing just what you said. It's just, they're just throwing information at people. So hopefully all that information will lead to, you know, them being considered deep. Uh, and so if we get to a place where we, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And we just, I love what you said about just, you know, going on a, on a like on a journey with someone. I mean, that's, that's what really can happen in a presentation or a message or a sermon, which is just so incredibly powerful. And it can happen just over coffee, you know, sitting with someone mm -hmm. when, you know, I lose the like, Hey, I don't have to impress you anymore because of how, you know, how smart I sound or how much information I have, or, you know, how much all of that kind of stuff, uh, which is, which is just huge. I wonder like what that process looks like for people. Like, uh, does that ring a bell to you at all or resonate or, um, yeah, if, if you are I on think, that kind of process. I, I think we confuse deepness for like intellectual thickness. You know, and so we want somebody to be deep. So we want them to be super academic and give me all these, you know, like, you know, Chicago Turabian footnotes in the message. And we confuse like intellectual rigor with deep. And it's not the same thing. I mean, it can be if you know how to take the information and plug it into the deeper desires and souls of the people that you're communicating with. What makes something deep is not you know, excess of information. There's plenty of people that have that and they're so dry and they're so boring and you can't follow where they're trying to take you. And everyone's lost thinking of like, Oh, we got to get to lunch. Can't wait till this person shuts up. And they're like, I'm so deep. And then you have the one that loves the intellectual rigor in the back. That's like, man, this is so deep. Um, it's, Deep is not necessarily just intellectual rigor, but it's it's addressing like the existential questions that people have and the doubts and and the sufferings and the real like questions of where does this information that is being communicated intersect my actual life that I have to live on a daily basis in more than a pragmatic way, but in a way that actually helps me discover who I am and why I'm here deep mm -hmm. is connecting meaning to information and that is not something that the pure academic is just ne necessarily naturally gifted to do when you can connect meaning yeah. to information then you have gone deep and sometimes you know that's telling the story of chippy being sucked in the vacuum i mean i remember <laughs> that story that you told all those years ago but you don't just tell the story to tell a story to get people to laugh and then move on you always connected that to a meaning of something which is why like um it's why we're still friends like you communicated so much <laughs> meaning and answered so many of my why questions that i am you know i am where i am because of where you led as a communicator for me in my life like i would have never mm. I was just going to be a cook for the rest of my life in that mountain jacks restaurant and then you connected meaning you took me deep and uh because you you answered bigger questions and showed me a bigger vision than what i was currently looking at and that was uh i was yeah you connected meaning into my life and that is deep not not just intellectual rigor yeah for sure Ooh, well man that's powerful stuff i uh but I think, I think we can do it all the time with the people who are in our lives where we, we want to attach something with meaning. You know, I, I think about like little practices that I do and that probably annoys people like crazy. But if I listen to a great podcast and I think, oh, my goodness, they have to hear this, I text them the podcast. Um, not, not because I want to be like, hey, you know, you need to learn this or do this, but because there was such meaning there. And I think, boy, you know, their soul would really resonate with that. You know, I mean, things like that, where we could just, you know, we have those moments where we're like, okay, we want to attach that meaning so we can, we can help them in such a powerful way. Um, you know, I think is, I think is so huge um, as well. And can you imagine though, if you and I just would have, I mean, and, and there's nothing wrong with being a cook. I mean, cooks are great. But we would have had a we would have had a pretty killer restaurant, you and I. I think we could have. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Uh, 
because you're a pretty mean cook. I'm a pretty mean cook, and we could have done some cool stuff, but we would have tied it to meaning. It would have been fun. True. It would have been awesome. We could have called it Tommy J's. Tommy J. Hey. TJ's? TJ's. Something like that. You know, my awesome. middle name well, is Joseph, and that was because my dad wanted to call me TJ, but he never did. So I just have the middle name of Joseph now, but I was never TJ. No, you just have it. Okay, so we talked about the, the soul of a communicator, health, some of the habits. Uh, what, what are some, like, you know, next level things that we can do, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're over the long run we're paying attention to our soul. Like what, what are some areas that we can go? I got to make sure that I keep my eye on this. Um, means and ends are a big deal. Um, we have our eyes on the ends, the goal, the vision, what we want out there. And then we communicate in ways to take people on a journey to get what we want, whether it is you know, we want people to change in some way or buy into a vision or to make some kind of an action. Um, that's the end goal that we want. And oftentimes yeah. we just forget about the means to get there. And right. what we forget is that the means is just as important as the ends because mm. how you get something determines who you are when you have it. Yes. And that is a big deal. Like, the journey you take to get what you want shapes you into the person who now has that thing. And now can yep. you hold that thing in a healthy way? Or did you use, you know, coercive, manipulative, violent, domineering ways to get what you want and now you'll be good with what you have? You won't because the means you use to get there shaped you into the kind of person that says, you know, these violent, coercive, manipulative ways are okay. Uh, and that isn't how you get something determines who you are when you have it. And what we're really keeping our eyes on when we're communicating is we're, we're trying to impart life to people, not just information mm. or a goal or something. And as communicators, we have to keep our eyes on the means that we are using to get to where we want to go. Because if we don't have our eyes on that, then we are unconsciously shaped into people that can be abusive and violent to get what we want just because the ends, you know, are, have a good end in mind. Um, if we're, if we're not keeping our eyes on how we're pursuing the end and how we're walking to get there and the means in which we're trying to get there, we'll become shaped and distorted people when we get there. And then we won't be able to occupy that space very well. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd add to that. I think sometimes we we don't want to deal with that space in between where this is where we're going. This is where we want to be. This is where I am now. And we, we you know, we don't want to do the hard work to to get all the way through that space. You know, we don't want to do the wrestling with God that happens. And, you know, the 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 long nights, the, you know, listening to the negative voices that that, that Satan is going to throw at us, all those different kind of things. But we've got to. It's all part of the journey, and and when we do, we've got to remember the means and the ends, and that's whew, that is that is incredibly incredibly powerful. Okay, our time is about up. Tom, is there anything that you would say to a young communicator? Uh, you know that would you would say, man, if I would have learned this, or if I would have employed this when I was a young communicator, things would have been so much different. Don't be afraid. Really, like mm. public speaking is the it seems to be like the number one fear that's out there three out of four people say they fear public speaking more than spiders which is illogical because spiders can kill you you know like <laughs> spiders are much more dangerous than public communicating but what we're most afraid of when we're communicating is putting ourselves on the line putting ourselves out there um and that's a risky thing to do but if we do it without fear, like if we understand that the majority of the people out there are not critiquing everything that we're saying and, you know, how we're looking and how we're communicating and how we're walking, if we could just get a little bit more comfortable in our own skin and in our own ideas, we won't have to um, do these impersonations of who we think we ought to be um, and project this false confidence that's out there. Just 
be realistic with who you are and the limitation of what you know in front of people. Be authentic with that. Don't be afraid of your limitations. If you're speaking on something and you don't understand it fully, don't pretend you do. You know, mm. say, say, you know, this is a big topic and I don't understand it all. But here's some things that I do understand that have helped me where I'm at in my journey. I hope they help you. And if you do that kind of communicating, you don't have to be the 100 percent absolute wise sage, you know, because as people are going to sniff that out. And if you're just totally authentic and honest with your own limitations, then you don't have to be afraid when they're discovered because you already put them out there and you're just being who you are in front of people in a way that you're trying to love them and take them on a journey to somewhere in, in some way that's going to yep. help them. That'd yep. be my number one, uh, I guess my number one advice that young Ooh. people get. Well, that's absolutely huge. That's absolutely huge. Well, we're going to have to do this a whole lot more because, you know, we could have talked, uh, you know, for a few hours here on, uh, on different topics, but you know, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast. I can't thank you enough just personally for your friendship over the years. I don't even know how many years if we met in 94, uh, are we 28, it's 28. 28 years? Wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, if people want to find you, where is a way that they can find you? Like you're, because you have sermons online, you have all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I am uh, a pastor at First Congregational Church of Langsburg. We have a YouTube page. We follow the liturgical calendar and I post my reflections on the scriptures there. Um, I'm sticking with the gospels lately. So it's usually just reflections on the narratives of the person of Jesus. Um, and that's mostly where I'm at. I am in the midst of crafting a podcast and starting it up. I'm also um, a spiritual director, uh, and you can reach out to me on Facebook um, and find me there. And I kind of hone in on Dark Nights of the Soul and the deconstruction process, and I, I kind of walk you through those um, those places where you just think you're losing your mind, losing your faith. I don't understand anything anymore. And I, I help you navigate those waters of the dark nights and the deconstructions um, mm. as, as a spiritual director. So that's kind of my two gigs right now. Love it. Well, we'll put those in the notes so people can find you and uh, appreciate you so much. And thanks for having this conversation, Tom. Hey, thanks for having me and I'll be back. For sure. <laughs>